hereby given a regular meeting of the Animal Service Advisory Committee of the City of San Angelo to be held on January 18th, 2018 at 12 p.m. at the McNeese Convention Center South Meeting Room 501 Rio Concho Drive, San Angelo, Texas, for the purpose of considering the following agenda items. Call the meeting to order. We'll start with recognition. Uh, Morgan. <coughs> Thank you. Chief Howard couldn't be with us today, but I did want to recognize him for his years of service on the Animal Shelter Advisory Committee. Uh, we did want to recognize his dedication to the No Kill Initiative, which is something that we um, took under when he uh, was sitting on the committee. Also, the improvements to the police animal control relations in that we can uh, rely on each other even better to ensure the public um, safety is maintained and that the public health is served, um, along with the many other accomplishments that we have um, tackled in his time. So uh, we're very grateful for his service. Thank you, Chief Howard, for all of his work, most definitely. Uh, next, we'll move to public comment. Issues or items that are not on the agenda may be raised by the public at this time. Citizens should speak from the podium, begin by stating their name, and limit remarks to less than three minutes. Committee members may request that a discussed item be placed on a future agenda. The committee takes public comment on all regular agenda items during the discussion of those items. Do we have any public comment today? I did want to take this opportunity to um, introduce our new shelter supervisor, Lindsay Newton, if you could join me up here, please. Um, we had talked at a previous meeting that this key position was vacant and that uh, we needed to have it filled, and so we were able to recruit and hire uh, Lindsay Newton. She has about 20 years experience in veterinary um, tech medicine, as in addition to several years already with the City of San Angelo Animal Services Division. Uh, she's worked in virtually every role that we have there at the shelter and is a key um, part to us moving forward with the initiative before this committee. Very nice to meet you guys. My name is Lindsay Newton, and uh, I'm just looking forward to the opportunity to be a part of the team at the animal shelter and move forward with improving some of the procedures in the back. So thank you. Welcome forward. Thank you. <clears throat> Another public comment, we'll, we'll move to the consent agenda. <laughs> Two items on the consent agenda consider approving the November 16th, 2017 Animal Shelter Advisory Committee regular meeting minutes and consider approving the December 14th, 2017 Animal Shelter Advisory Committee regular meeting minutes. Have we reviewed those minutes? Anyone have any changes or questions? Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. A motion and a second. All in favor? Opposed? All right, on to the regular agenda, discussion and possible action related to monthly shelter numbers for November 17. <clears throat> As you'll recall, um, our December meeting was brief and just a special meeting to go over one item. And so I'm just now able to bring y'all the uh, November figures for our activity uh, for that month. So of course, as we continue in the No Kill Initiative, there were zero adoptable pets euthanized. Uh, that makes 20 months in a row at that time uh, into that initiative. And we had 20 citizens using the microchipping clinic. As always, I'll continue to plug that um, any Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., uh, we offer microchipping services it's $13 for the life of the pet. Um, that is wide open to the public. It is required by city ordinance if you in live inside city limits, and it is uh, really a reduced cost compared to the old way of doing city tags. So uh, we are encouraging folks to do more and more of that, but that was the activity for the month of November. Uh, for the month of November, intake was um, a little down at 438 uh, new arrivals. Uh, we did still continue um, adoption strong at about 164 adoptions. Uh, we had 45 animals redeemed by owner. Uh, that is an increase um, from months that y'all have seen recently. That is still due to the uh, strong ties with the Contra Valley Paws local lost and found website, Help Me Get Home. We continue to have a tremendous amount of success from that. That's also due to an increase in uh, rabies quarantine cases. Uh, we had a, a, a SOP before y'all in the past about tightening up on our regulations on who goes into quarantine, um, who's um, eligible for that. And so as owners are coming in redeeming their animals at the end of that quarantine period, that also shows in our redeem by owner. So uh, roughly half and half, either people just looking for their lost and found pet or checking them out of quarantine uh, makes up that 45 figure there. 
Uh, then uh, we did unfortunately have to euthanize 210 animals. Uh, this was due to uh, either being feral, injured, sick, or aggressive. That is what we've defined under the no-kill initiative as uh, the only times we would consider um, euthanizing. Of course, those were feral cats not identified in some way to be able to go back to a colony. These were simply um, spontaneously occurring feral cats that, that the public brought in, okay? Um, and then we did have, unfortunately, three um, deaths in custody. So at the end of the month, we had 251 lives left in the shelter. Um, that is a, um, you know, when I get to about 285, I get a little nervous. So uh, we ended the month uh, pretty strong there with uh, only 251 lives in the shelter. Um, and I did want to point out that it, it's noteworthy that we were at a 69% re live release rate this month. Um, that's the highest it's been. Uh, really since this no-kill initiative. And so uh, when you look at those owner redemptions, when you look at those adoptions side by side with our intake, um, we really had a banner month for November in that way, okay? did want to delve a little farther into the euthanasia because we do want to look for more opportunities to prevent euthanasia to get ahead of things uh, related to that. Um, so I do report this additional information for y'all's review. Um, we had 112 cats that were unfortunately euthanized. That is largely, um, you'll see that the, the majority of that is due to them being feral. Um, and then we had 74 dogs that we euthanized and we also had two deer that came in injured and could not be rehabbed and so um, we were um, unfortunately forced to euthanize them as well as 22 skunks that um, citizens had caught in live traps and were unable to safely relocate them to a new area and so um, every one of those calls we do go ahead and, and euthanize them uh, because they are one of those top five um, high risk for um, carrying rabies. Another way to break down that 210, um, as I mentioned on the prior slide, over 100 of the euthanasias were cats. Of those 112 cats, 73 were feral. Um, and so that is the majority of, of what we're seeing in our cats that are being euthanized. Um, in addition to those owner redemptions of rabies quarantine cases, we also have uh, 44 animals that were euthanized either due to aggression, they came in as stray or owner surrender as aggression, or they were at the uh, quarantine for bite and the owner opted to go ahead and surrender them at the time, or they were stray. Uh, unfortunately, if we can't contract an owner and it's a bite animal, we do go ahead um, and euthanize at that time. And so, and then one was an owner requested. Occasionally, uh, a private citizen will come in with their elderly or sick animal and say, I can't afford it through a veterinarian. Can y'all go ahead and um, euthanize, you know, euthanize? So we did have one of those in the month of November. And that is your November figures. Questions? Uh, yeah, I have one. Uh, what were the reasons the, uh, the uh, I guess it was the dogs died, or the animals that died in-house? What, what were the reasons for those deaths? It was a, two of them were a sudden onset illness, meaning that over a weekend they developed, we left on a Friday, they did not have parvo, uh, we came in on over the weekend and our staff identified that they did die suddenly from uh, symptoms that we would uh, correlate with parvovirus. And then one of them came in very ill um, and we tried to to, to do what we could for it, and unfortunately it passed away um, instead of um, thriving from the disease they had contracted before arrival. Thank you. Yes. Any public comment? We'll move on to our December 2017 numbers. <clears throat> Uh, so for the month of December, um, I'll say that we had um, the first three weeks of December, uh, we were running ACEs. We had a ton of adoptions happening. Intake was way down. Uh, we were able to really focus on some key projects around the shelter itself, um, things that we ordinarily don't have time to spend on. Um, and then the last week of December, we were just bamboozled <laughs> with new arrivals. So um, you'll see that in just a moment. Uh, very similar here. Uh, we are now, we're now 21 months into the No-Kill Initiative and 25 citizens uh, using the micro chip clinic. So as I mentioned, you'll see December intake was lower at 362 animals. We had a net increase of 50 animals in just the three days we were open between Christmas and Thanksgiving. So 
we um, that was of course with the onset of the inclement weather. So lots of folks uh, were calling saying there are stray dogs out in this freezing weather. There are um, people who are out of town who've um, left their their pets out in this freezing weather. And so um, we did have a tremendous number of animals come in just in that three day period. Um, and so that's why at the end of the month you see we were at 279 um, animals left in the shelter. Uh, we did have 107 adoptions, which is is very strong for December. Um, and then. 49 uh, animals were redeemed by their owner and then here we are even better at almost a 71 percent uh, live release rate of course you'll see that even if adoptions are mostly static if intake is down that really helps our our, our live release rate there of the 178 animals um, that were euthanized, 97 were cats, 64 were dogs. Uh, we had one possum that, that was injured and we um, euthanized it. We had two raccoons, uh, four deer, and 10 skunks. Okay. Uh, then into uh, December, to break that down a different way, uh, 56 of the euthanasias were being due to being um, sick, injured, or failure to thrive. 71 were feral cats. 32 were either aggressive or bite quarantine. 11 were wildlife. Um, and then seven were um, dead on arrival or died in custody. Um, I believe one of those was the deer um, that we tried to rush it to our facility, see if we could get in contact with a wildlife rehabilitator to see if we could get in touch with the um, uh, game warden. Unfortunately, that animal passed before we could get it care. Um, its injuries uh, were too serious to sustain life at that point, okay? And back into December. Any public comment? Uh, item C is discussion of possible action related to the animal control procedures for cruelty cases. So the, the, the animal control out in the field, when we get a call for animal cruelty, um, Lindsay and I had a um, learning curve on this when, when in June uh, we got a call from a landlord that said um, we've had, um, well they didn't know at the time, but it was 24 chihuahuas that were abandoned in a small efficiency apartment um, for greater than three days. And so uh, we did a tremendous amount of research um, to determine how, how best to handle those cases in the future, what are our legal um, allowances, uh, what things do we need to uh, defer to law enforcement on, what all those things are. And so I did wanna bring you all a brief of, of what we came up with as a result of that. And we've had a number of those cases since, um, and I'll speak to kind of the most common calls that we get for animal cruelty. Um, so the state health code uh, mandates what animal cruelty is, uh, but those, so does city ordinance as well, okay? So in the state health code, there are really these major reasons why um, it would be identified as a cruelty case. An animal is deemed to be cruelly treated if it is unreasonably abandoned, which we get a lot of, if it's unreasonably deprived of food and care and shelter, which goes right alongside with the first one, if it is tortured, seriously overworked, cruelly confined, or caused to fight with another animal. We don't get very many calls on this component of it, um, luckily. So that is um, that is what's defined in the state code as what is cruel, okay? Um, so really we made a lot of trees of this, a lot of if statements of, well, if you arrive on the scene and it's this, then do that. So that that's, um, if you'll allow me, that's what I'll go through here um, shortly. So um, if the proper, property owner is there, as I mentioned, it may be the homeowner, it may, it may be the occupant, it may be the landlord, it may be the resident. Um, if someone is there to allow us on the property, we would immediately observe the conditions. We would photograph immediately with the animal in those conditions. That's very important for proving our case um, through the court system. Uh, we would ask for a signed property release form. In that property release form, we're asking to document the animals that are impounded. And so, for example, it was difficult to do that in this one case in June because I didn't know which animals were male, female in that moment. There's a lot of them, right? They were all tan chihuahuas, right? So um, we had to go back to the shelter and assess what that was um, after the fact. But ideally, you're documenting what animals, a brief description, the number of them um, in that original document for the um, property owner to sign at that time. So, and, and, and that, pro that uh, property release form allows us to take those animals into our shelter to get them the necessary care and to move forward from there of what do we do next? Meaning, is there a pet owner we can contact? Um, do we put them on a 10-day owned hold and then place them up for adoption? There are a number of things that can happen from that point, okay? 
Now, if the property owner is not available, um, there are a couple options that you would go here. So um, if the animal is in immediate life danger, uh, we would immediately request for San Angelo Police Department backup. Um, this happens quite frequently. We've seen this in the last week or so that um, a citizen calls in after hours. It is freezing rain outside. Um, <coughs> there is an animal that is unsheltered that is in the backyard and nobody is home and hasn't been home for some days. So oftentimes police is already on the scene and they're calling us as an after hours call out to go meet them at the scene and to, um, to gain custody of those animals at that time. So in any case, uh, we would need a peace officer officer there with us at that time, right? Because there's nobody allowing us access to the property. Um, if the officer agrees, we may enter the property. I, you know, In most circumstances, we're seeing the dog outside in its yard, in its enclosure. We can observe that the conditions are such that they're in immediate life danger. That's, an, that's a very... Um, specific judgment call that my folks are making. Uh, we are quickly taking photographs of the animal. Of course, our first reaction is get the animal to safety, get the animal somewhere warm. But even if it's 30 seconds, just stop, take photographs. We need to be able to document what we observed at the scene with more than simply our own statement of what happened, okay? Um, and then we would transport the animals to safety and obtain a seizure warrant as soon as is feasible, okay? So uh, we would at that time document um, what we saw, um, what was at the scene, uh, was there appropriate food, water, shelter, all of those things, um, as well as the description of the animal or animals, um, and then take it to our <coughs> municipal court judge for signature. So I have a question as far as the obtained seizure warrant. Um, if it's uh, post action after the animal's already seized, what happens if, say, the judge or whoever's issuing it uh, disagrees with you and denies the warrant, uh, what would result? Because I guess that would be kind of a gray area that I'm not too sure what would happen. So I'm just asking the question. Yes, we would make contact with the, oh, it, it would be our, our primary goal to make contact with the owner. And so if we place them on a 10-day owned hold, we want to return them back to the original person. If the judge says, you did not have grounds to take these animals, we do not agree this was immediate life danger. We do not agree that this was cruelly treated. Um, it's unusual that the judge would make that call at that time, but there, you know, if we didn't have our burden of evidence, right? They aren't hearing the evidence at that point, but they need um, some assurances from us. So um, we would continue to make contact with that owner uh, to return the animals to that owner. Okay, I just wanted to... No, and I know other people might have had that question. So. Absolutely. Very Thank good. You. Morgan, do you have any, like, <clears throat> guidelines that, that your staff is going by to determine immediate life danger? Yes, and it goes back to the state health code. It, 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 it identifies if an animal is out in extreme weather, if, if an animal is, uh, so that could be extreme heat or extreme cold. Um, it could be if the animal is tethered and that tether is too short and the dog is hanging itself. Um, it, there are a number of things and it would be a decision made together with the peace officer that yes, this animal is in immediate life danger. Uh, we authorize you to take, um, to enter the, the, the private property. Okay. And the reason I ask that question is because for years, some of the things that, that I've heard is that some of the, the issues as far as getting help, the animal, getting help to the animal was that they did have shelter available. And then, but my definition of what a, sh a proper shelter is, is greatly different from what some are. Is there, is there a plan to have some kind of definition in place so that you have a hard core thing to go to because I know in inclement weather I mean again that's something that again is kind of subjective the state um, health that code. we ran into this last cold front right yes ma'am absolutely the state health code does state what they defined as a secure shelter and as an appropriate shelter. Uh, we, can, of course, at the city level, the council can consider being more strict from that, and they would look for recommendations from y'all on if we want to define that means these things. Um, so there is an actual definition that is uh, for, I guess, purpose of law that does define proper shelter. In a and, broad sense, yes. Yeah, it's just not explained in full detail here currently. Right and now. I may not agree with it. I would well, never shelter my animals that way, but yeah. it would be... State law is very... Vague. It's purposely very vague. vague. I have a question on that part. As far as shelter is concerned, do you take into consideration the type of animal it is, the type of dog, for example? You have short-coated dogs, you have long-coated dogs. There's a lot of difference in the conditions they can live in. 
Yes, sir. And if you have like a small igloo doghouse and a German Shepherd, we would identify that as insufficient shelter. But if you had a dachshund, that probably would have been sufficient shelter for him. And so that, yes, sir, that is a good point. We take that into consideration as well. It is very rare that we're going on your private property and taking your animal. We want every assurance that we can prove that dog's life was in immediate danger. It is, we document the heck out of those cases. I'll, I'll, I'll just to be blunt, <laughs> because that is um, something we want to be able to defend. Um, the next branch of this tree, so to speak, is um, if the property owner is still not available, but the animal is not in immediate life danger. This is the most frequent call that we have. Um, there's an absentee tenant or landlord situation. Um, the tenant has moved out, left the animals behind, whatever it may be. And so we want to go ahead and photograph again. I like lots of pictures. We want to see what's going on. Um, and then we call for backup. We ask for a second animal control officer to come to the scene to secure the scene. Stay here with these animals while I go write a seizure warrant. And so if that way, if the property owner does come back, we can um, inform them on proper um, care for the animals, have a dialogue about, do we still take these animals into custody? What do we do? Um, and also we have, um, because it's not uncommon that a neighbor or a family member is coming by to feed the animals. And so they see that there's been some activity, there's a door hanger from animal control, and they're like, well, let me hurry and get these animals inside. Well, that doesn't prevent the fact that we observed a violation, we observed animals being cruelly treated, we still want to be able to pursue that complaint. And so the person who first responded to the call, the person that that is their case, the animal control officer that wrote the, uh, took those photographs, will come to me and together we'll write the seizure warrant um, for the judge's consideration at that time. Um, and so so ideally we're going to the home with a signed warrant to take the animals. That is, I think what we would say is the tightest procedure legally, um, that we already have all that documentation in place. It is our favorite way to do things. Um, but when you're dealing in after hours call outs, um, emergency situations, we do have these other places in place um, in the event that we can't do this. But in a perfect world, I have a seizure warrant before I'm even touching your animals, okay? So oh, once the animals are in our um, custody, at that point, we would, again, uh, attempt to notify the owner. We want them to know that um, there's been a situation. Um, it's not uncommon that they say, what? I hired my brother-in-law to care for my animals. How did this go wrong? And so we try to work with them on um, a... Um, a solution, it may mean getting their dogs back it may, or their animals back, um, but we we just need to, for them to immediately know, hey, there was a situation, uh, we need you to know that, that now we're going to um, um, pursue a cruelty case on the situation, okay? Uh, we also offer an owner release at that time um, to the owner. It's not uncommon that they say, you know what, this dog wandered up about a year ago, I started feeding it. I don't do anything to care for this animal. It's become more of a hassle than I really want to bother with. I'll go ahead and sign an owner release to y'all. You already have the dog. You can place it up for adoption, do whatever you want with it. But I didn't care for the animal. That's true. And I'm happy to give it up to y'all. Uh, so we do go ahead and offer that. Um, can, can I interrupt just real quick? I'm curious, what happens in those situations when they sign and let you just go ahead and take uh, ownership of the dog to offer for adoption? Um, is, are they, do, do they have any ramifications for the neglect at that point? Correct. It's just one tool in our toolbox of things. Yes, you signed the owner surrender form, that helps, but I'm still going to file a complaint with the court. I still observed a violation. I'm still going to hold those animals in custody because it is, it, this is very important. We house the animals for the time prescribed by the court proceedings. So, to, to, in, in real life, this is how this would work out. I come to the judge. I have pictures. I have a warrant. I say, please sign this warrant. He does. We serve the warrant. We impound the animals, okay? Um, they said it, when the judge signs the warrant, he sets a hearing date. On this day, I will hear the evidence about this case. So we house the animals until that hearing date, okay? After the hearing date, if the judge makes a court order on that day, he makes a judgment call on that day, um, the individual in most cases, depending on what the violation is, has still has 10 days to appeal that to a higher power. They say, I don't agree with the judge. I want to appeal it. I'm still housing and caring for the animals. They are not available for adoption. They are not available for euthanasia. They simply stay in my facility. We are housing them um, as long as that takes. So you could continue appealing. There's a long process that can become, become of that. And that's why we offer for the owner release immediately because that helps a lot to to cut down on that time frame if these animals were cruelly treated it is not in their best interest to stay in my facility an extended period of time if they
they were cruelly treated and adoptable, I want to get them into homes very quickly. Um, they need that TLC, that rehab, um, sooner than later. And so it's one tool in the box, but it does not absolve them of any guilt for the incident that we've already identified. Um, so the complaint is something that uh, my staff and I meet the next business day and we draft that complaint, we get it to the municipal prosecutor who's been tremendously helpful in outlining how this process works for us. And so in that we have the story of what happened, we have the description of the animals, uh, we attach all supporting documentations, our, our case sheets on the animals, our observations of their health and wellness, uh, photographs, um, all of those things. And so all of that goes to the municipal prosecutor um, for support of a hearing, or even if there's not a hearing, I just need um, it to enter the court system at that point to decide what's gonna happen from there. If they sign an owner release and there's still a court proceeding, does the owner release allow you to put them up for adoption at that time, or do you still have to wait for court proceedings? The judge can still order me to hold them for a certain amount of time. So we would not do anything permanent with the animal, whether it's, um, euthanasia or adoption uh, without um, the judge weighing in on, on when we're doing that process. Mm -hmm. and, and I say euthanasia and the reason I do is because we've not had this case recently, but in the event that an animal was cruelly treated and they are injured or sick or unwell beyond any rehab or health or anything, it, it's, it's cruel in my opinion for me to keep them. Uh, for an extended period of time. And so um, luckily, every animal that we've had this happen with is very adoptable pets. Um, but we do recognize that when we're using words like cruelly treated, that can be quite severe uh, for the long-term health and wellness of that animal. So we went over kind of some of this, but in that court order, when the judge has his hearing, he can convey the animal to the city at that point. And as I mentioned, we would hold for 10 additional days in the event of an appeal. Um, and, and I wanted to point out our, our preferred method of dealing with cruelly treated animals is to um, solicit Contra Valley Paws for transport. And the reason for that is, um, you know, as big as our community is, we're used, it's still kind of a small town. So in the event that the, these animals were seized from an individual and those people and that individual did not want their animals seized and the court awards them to me, I don't want an adopter to inherit a um, problem. I go to the dog park with my dog and a stranger comes up to me and says, that was my dog and the city took it from me. And so I, because we have these relationships with um, facilities who um, have the capacity to take on animals, my preferred method is to transport these animals out for adoption um, so that these adopters are removed from any criminal proceedings that were going on uh, with this animal before its time. Um, it, that happens. That happened with the, the 20 or so chihuahuas that we seized back in June. Uh, we had, uh, they were very adoptable. They were, um, the risk facilities were grateful to have them. And that was our preferred method for handling that situation that after all those court proceedings ended, uh, we were able to match them with homes, uh, but not locally. And I think that that was really beneficial from a, um, well, from a, a lot of perspectives. <laughs> So that's what I have before you for cruelty cases. Um, we did not have a standard operating procedure in place uh, for this type of activity um, before I wrote this. So this is before you all for consideration if you wanted to approve this as this is the way we will deal with um, cruelty cases. I think it seems to be a fair uh, method. Um, obviously there's some more finer details that actually have in the procedure handbook, I'm sure. But as a general outline, I'd find that be a fairly simple, consistent way of dealing with them. So anyone else have any thoughts on that? Um, Can you take a vote on that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do a motion? A motion. A second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Um, Item D, discussion of possible action related to animal control procedures for tethering dogs. 
did want to brief y'all on um, the law as it relates to tethering dogs or the restraint of dogs. Um, this is governed by, again, state health code as well as city ordinance. The city ordinance in this case is more restrictive than the state um, laws, um, and that's by design with what our, this committee and what council was comfortable with. And so that's really where I'm going to focus most of my time on because it is more restrictive. It is what we're um, implementing locally and, and what we are dealing with um, daily, okay? Um, so, in the city ordinance, it states that in a 24-hour period, you may not, you shall not, um, tether your dog for more than two hours at a time. Uh, the only exceptions to that would be is if you were on a walk for more than two hours, if you go hiking with your dog, uh, you can have it on a leash uh, for more than two hours at a time because we uh, do require uh, the leashing of animals. Or if you are camping or at a recreational area, you may tether your animal in those circumstances. So, if you're simply in your home and you're using the um, tethering as the primary enclosure, for the animal that is not allowed um, that is the animal must have a sufficient enclosure um, whether it be a fenced in area or a dog run or whatever it is it cannot be um, on a tether on a chain um, on a rope um, for its 24 7 existence okay um, one component of the law, it states that you may have 15 days to become compliant, and we find that that has some um, difficulty in implementation in real life, meaning that um, if it states that you cannot tether for more than two hours in a 24-hour period, the way we log that is I do not allow an animal control officer to sit in front of your residence for 120 minutes. Uh, what we do is we respond to a complaint, we identify your dog on a tether, we try to make contact with you. We knock on the door and say, hey, did you know your dog's on the tether and that's not allowed? How long's he been out here? And some people say, oh, I just shampooed the carpets. In about 30 minutes, I'm going to let my dog in. This just happened. And we say, great, just so you know, you're not allowed to keep him out there more than two hours at a time. I'm grateful that you're compliant with the rules. Uh, we will check back later and make sure that what you said is true. Okay, um, so when we make that first contact, we do try to attempt compliance immediately. Hey, what's going on? We noticed this dog was on a tether. Um, in the event that we're not able to make contact with you and gain compliance immediately, um, we would check every 30 minutes. Um, so let's say at two o'clock, we responded to a call at your residence. We noticed that the dog was on a tether at 2.30, 3 o'clock, 3.30, and 4 o'clock. We create a log. We note those times. We note that the um, incident is unchanged. And so what someone might say is, well, my defense is I took it off for 15 minutes and put it back on while you were gone. Okay. But in a 24 hour period, it can't be two hours cumulatively. So it still adds up. It's still um, in that area where it would be non-compliant with city ordinance. Um, so at that point, in the event that we're unable to um, gain compliance, we leave a door knocker. If we thought it was cruel, as we discussed earlier, if we thought that that animal was unsafely tethered, we would seek a cruelty um, uh, charge through the, the prior procedure we went through. But in the event the dog has food, the dog has water, the dog has shelter, they're just tethered for more than the time. Uh, we leave a, a hanger on the front door to say, hey, call us. We have a problem. We need to talk about it. And at that point, they get home from work and they're like, yeah, I tether my dog every day when I go to work for eight hours. Well, it's not allowed. We would like to give you 15 days to become compliant with um, building a secure enclosure, purchasing whatever's necessary to get that animal in uh, something that they're not using tethering as the primary means of restraint. Let me ask a question there. If you're giving them 15 days, does that mean they can still continue to tether a dog eight hours a day, 10 hours a day? It does, but this also says that I can cite you at the end of two hours. So does that mean I can cite you at two hours, three hours, four hours? So the way we've dealt with this is if we've made contact with you, if I've informed you of the uh, necessary improvements and you're agreeing to do that and I see progress, then we're not gonna cite you every day that it's wrong. Um, I guess we could. It's not, uh, we've not done that. Um, it's not uncommon, uh, and unfortunately, it's not uncommon that someone says, you know what, my dog runs away all the time. I can't keep them in the yard. I've tried everything. The only way I can keep the animal safe and the neighborhood safe is to put it on a tether. So if you're going to cite me for keeping on a tether 24-7, then I want to give the animal to you. And so nine times out of ten, that's what happens. Either they take it off the tether and they say, oh, yeah, I have a backyard. I just didn't put the dog back there. They take it off the tether. They gain compliance immediately. Or they say, thanks for bringing this up. I was hoping you'd come by. Here's my dog. I don't want it anymore. And so it's unfortunate, but in the long term, is that better for the animal that it's not on a tether for the rest of its life? Sure. Um, but th that's the there is that gray area of do you have two hours to become compliant or do you have 15 days to become compliant? 
What made you decide 15 days? I don't know. That was That's in the ordinance. Um, it was in a prior discussion uh, before this committee and ultimately to city council. Um, that's not something that I said at my level. That's something that's been written into law. Okay. How difficult is this for you to enforce? What are some of the challenges that, sh that your animal control officers have? The biggest challenge is folks aren't home. Um, folks ignore our door knockers. Uh, we go by again and again and again and have trouble gaining compliance. And so... Um, Would you like to see this uh, 15 days to be compliant reduced? Would that help or would you need... Or do you think that even if there was a reduced amount of time, say 10 or 7 days, do you think that would change it? I've discussed this... Um, this service with with other cities and they do it a variety of ways some do it exactly like we do and they're like yeah there are flaws in the system but you know the majority of the time we're gaining compliance some are way more lenient and they're like you're absolutely allowed to tether your animal no problem and then some are in infinitely more strict a few very small you know bedroom type communities where they have highly regulating how their citizens can live and so um, I'm not before you today with any necessary edits to the to the plan. It's admittedly um, it's admittedly odd to read, but in real life application, it's working. It's it's working for us. Um, so, it, so it is working, but there's occasionally one or two hiccups. But if we but if you changed it, it would probably create more headaches. I don't I don't know a better way. Every any way you could change this is going to have its own set of headaches, and so. Even if it takes three days, three weeks, some amount of time for me to gain compliance, at some point, um, I, I authorize an animal control officer to swing their shift. And they're like, well, instead of working eight to five today, I'm going to work seven to four because I can catch folks before they go to work. Even the busiest person who is working two jobs, who is a single parent, who all of these things, and they're like, I got your door knocker. I don't have time to call you back. I'm never home. Good luck finding me. At 7 a.m., most folks are home. Um, and so... If we have to get creative with making contact with this owner to to gain compliance, um, that's the hardest part is getting in front of the pet owner to say, did you know this was the law? We'd like to encourage you to be compliant. Um, and if you don't, there, there can be repercussions, so please do so. And at that point, we do gain a lot of compliance after we are ultimate, ult over that first hurdle of getting in front of a real human. Yeah, um, that seems like a... I don't see, I agree with you. I don't think changing the law any from currently where it is at the city level would be useful. Uh, one of my concerns is, and of course I would never bring forth a criticism without hopes of trying to figure out how to make it better. But during the last cold spurt that we had, we are, I know pause phones was ringing off the hook. I know animal control was, and I also know the SAPD was getting multiple calls. Um, and I don't know how effective all of this was because I was getting calls from the same person multiple times that they had reached out for help that this animal is in, you know, subpar conditions and, and needed needed assistance. So that's why I reached out to you to try to get a better understanding of how you're enforcing it because I know that it's, it's got to be difficult. I know that in the state law it has the inclement weather, um, but I, I don't know if, if we need to put more parameters on there. Uh, more definitions on there to give you more teeth in this ordinance. And that's all I'm looking for because I thought um, it was incredibly disappointing <laughs> to see how many animals were left out on chains um, in this weather. Um, and uh, that, that's the kind of thing that I'm, that I'm after a resolution for. What can, you know, what can we do? What can we help you to do? Is this, is this working? Is this absolutely the best it's going to get in enforcing that in these extreme cases when we do have the extreme weather? So the, the situation you're describing, I would actually follow the procedure for animal cruelty um, instead of tethering, and that's what we did. And every one of the uh, incidents that we got a call out for or we saw on social media, folks that uh, some were contacting y'all directly instead of us, every one of those cases we either gained compliance or are in custody of the animal. I don't know of any lingering ones that have not been dealt with. It may have taken some time there, um, but we did build our case and get um, compliance or gain custody of each of the animals over the amount of time. And if there's not one, please let me know. Okay, well, uh, there, there's a couple. And the, and the reason I question is a, 
I'm thinking now that maybe I understand maybe what's happening. If you're they're gaining compliance, they're bringing the animal in while you're you're there, but the animal can be returned after you're gone and be put back in those situations. Well, they're informed that they're <coughs> subject to citation and cruelty charges if they do do that, um, in which case we need to get back out there and, and ultimately impound the animals even if uh, with a seizure warrant if they uh, don't do it on their own merit. Okay. Well, maybe a better way instead of actually trying to edit the law, it's just better to edit the operating procedure for the call outs for animal cruelty and have a follow up, you know, within an X number of time period to guarantee or prove that they have done it. Um, that would probably be a better way of doing it because honestly, rewriting the law where you can just instead tell the animal ACO, go back in hour, hour, 30 minutes, two hours, whatever be a good appropriate time and have them check out and make sure that they're still in compliance and then have a follow-up the next day at random times, maybe a couple times throughout the day, would probably be better than trying to rewrite the law because the law has already got severe punishments if you just, if you don't follow it. It's just that compliance can, like you said, be temporary, but it might be better to just have more follow-up on that part. And that might be more manpower issue than law issue because really restricting the laws tighter and tighter what you're going to have is you're going to develop harder and harder to either a gain compliance from the people that are there b you're going to have an influx of animals into the shelter because you're now removing them from there even though if given enough opportunity or maybe some more penalty for not following the aco the first time that might be a better solution than just saying, oh, I'm just going to tighten the law tighter, 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 give it more teeth, and then create a manpower issue where you still end up with animals in the shelter versus out. So maybe it's better to address it with more follow-ups and calls and checks than it is to actually do the other because that would probably be a lot more effective long run. And it would be more PR uh, better for the public relations because education really is what it gets down to and if you don't educate and if you don't educate and if you have to educate through monetary or court uh, penalties that usually will start getting the attention of said person uh, because hundred dollar fine the first time two hundred dollar fine the second time and however high it goes up up to jail time eventually they start learning their lesson about after the second or third time and that would probably be a lot more useful than anything else. Well, can I add something to that? My concern about adding more parameters within the statute is, or in the code is that every parameter you add is something that our prosecutor is going to have to prove up in court. So having broader discretion for our animal control officers lets them just testify about what they, see, they saw, and it's one less element for us to prove. Um, at some point, though, animal cruelty no longer becomes a municipal court issue and goes over to the district attorney's office. And so at that point, that's when the jail, state jail felonies and the $10,000 fines and those sorts of things kick in. Your um, authority only covers Class C misdemeanor animal control issues. So there's only a limited amount of you know, teeth, additional teeth we can put in it because we're capped just by being a Class C. So by restraint, when they come into compliance, um, with the example of the, the recent cold fronts, bringing them into compliance, what does that mean in that case? Is that that they provided a dog house or they brought the dog inside or what what would be compliance in that situation? Yes, sufficient shelter, food, water. Okay. Yes, and to speak to, to Dr. Schulte's point that um, – A lot of these complaints are coming through every mean possible. Hey, I saw this on this day. And so we're encouraging folks, please call animal services immediately to make this complaint. If you text me at 10 o'clock at night, I'm going to call my folks, but they can't do much without the police call out. So if it is, uh, so call animal services. If you call us during normal hours, we're going to answer the phone. We're going to dispatch somebody immediately. If you call us after hours, there's a recording that says, call this number for after hours call out. Every single police call out that we get for a cruelty case like this over the weather, even in anticipation of weather coming this evening, we were responding to. So there's not 
one time that we didn't go out. We didn't. And so if, if we can look at adding this additional follow-up in an hour and a half in the morning, in the day, whatever it may be, um, that, that that's fine to be able to consider adding that. But I did want to point out that every call we're getting, we're responding to. I'm concerned about the calls we're not getting. Yeah, I, I knew that you were uh, getting all the going to the calls that you were getting. I was just saying for maybe to help enforce compliance, just the follow up the next day or maybe an hour or two later might be better. We can look into how to implement that. And one thing about this is for tethering. That doesn't alter the other issues and the other conditions that have to be met to be taking care of your dog. If you don't give them water, if you don't have food for them or you don't have shelter for them, uh, they still can be charged with cruelty. Uh, that's a different issue than whether they were tethered and had that or not tethered and had that. That yes, yeah. it can be untethered and still charged with cruelty. We're talking right. about. So no recommended changes at this time. Just wanted to update y'all as it seemed timely and um, wanted y'all to have this information. Then I guess uh, are we done with the topic? Is that the last slide, Morgan? Okay. We have public comment. We'll step up to the podium, sir. Only <coughs> on the tethering of dogs. If you'll state your name, please, sir. Bill Lockett. And on the tethering of dogs, you usually find it's very simple for an animal control officer to look at the dog where it's tethered, and you usually find a di if there's a dish there, it's foot half full of sand or dirt, and of course it's not not being used. So there's many uh, indications on how long the dog's been there. <coughs> the, there's a trail worn out around what he's tethered to, and uh, so it's not hard for animal control officer to know if that dog has been there or is being tethered a long time. And that would be the indicator to go back and check on the dog, as, uh, as she indicated, and uh, make further charges, you know, other than tethering. I do know. Uh, I happened to be on the committee back when this tethering uh, ordinance was put in place, and we, we did all this work on it. We spent a lot of time on it at that time, and uh, we felt we came up with a, a good system with the two hours. We're actually more stringent than the state is. Uh, the state just doesn't lie between 10 and 6, 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Well, two hours, uh, that's more stringent than what they are. So I, I think our city ordinance is real good on that. So because this is currently in place, we don't need to take a vote on it? Correct. Just an infor informational okay. item. No action taken. Okay. Next, uh, we have number six, follow-up and administrative issues. I have nothing. I have a motion to adjourn. I apologize. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. There's more to that ordinance too, and as far as where they can be tethered and how far away from the fence and how long the tether is versus. So the dog oh, can't wow. go we were nervous about putting it back together again for the first time. Sure. But it was so yeah. sweet.